for inviting me here to speak today. I'm going to talk about media, and by the media I mean the news media. And I'm a part of that community. And I want to talk about the role that the media plays in the wider community. So I want us to look at the, media, the media's impact, good and bad, in a democracy like ours, what we should watch for, and how we might respond. And at the end of it all, I'm going to give you, particularly the students at Radford, a bit of advice, because I'm like that. Uh, at first, I need to explain who I mean when I talk about the media and what happens when you boil a frog. Our definition of the media is changing and technology is at the heart of that. When I started in journalism, you worked for newspapers or magazines, radio or television. But then that was quite a while ago. We had only started using calculators in class when I was in high school and computers were just starting to appear. By my last year in high school, we got a word processor at home which had a black screen and typed in bright green letters and you could type up your essays and play Space Invaders. <coughs> it was very exciting. There was no Facebook, no Twitter or Tumblr or Instagram or Pinterest or Snapchat or any of those other social media sites because there was no internet. Let's contemplate that for a minute. There was no internet. I am that old. If you wanted to know something, you had to ask someone who knew or look it up in a book or an encyclopedia. They don't really exist anymore. So in my first newspaper job at the Canberra Times, we had migrated from typewriters to computers and there was this machine in a locked glass cabinet called the fax. And occasionally it would make this whirring sound and it would spit out this sort of roll of paper with printed stuff on it and we would press our faces against the glass in complete awe at the fax and only certain people were allowed to touch it. This was what passed for cutting edge technology. Cameras had film in them and it had to be developed in dark rooms with chemicals, and there weren't any mobile phones. The first ones we had access to 25 years ago were the size of two house bricks together on a shoulder strap with a wiggly cord and a very large handset. Then they migrated to a smaller size, which was about the size of one house brick, kind of cut in half, long ways, with a very long aerial and push button. Uh, push buttons on it, and you were, fancied yourself was pretty important if you got to go away with a mobile phone. In fact, one of my colleagues, I remember standing on um, the side of a, an airstrip in a regional Australia on an election campaign, sort of posing, talking on her mobile phone and falling in a hole because she wasn't paying attention. So, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty important to be walking around with one of those things. Um, so they were different days. And, you know, I used to sit on a bus and call my family and friends and tell them, you know, I'm, I'm travelling on the election campaign. Uh, I'm on a bus and they were, you know, very excited. So. What this tells us is in a very relatively short time, things have changed, things change fast. These days you can broadcast to the world from the palm of your hand. You can have a personal following on Twitter that's bigger than the circulation of some newspapers. You can stream video live, send out photographs, design your own digital memes and post them on one of a zillion sites, scan and transmit documents instantaneously and talk to or text anyone with a phone almost anywhere in the world. And I still enjoy ringing my parents from strange places and saying, hi, guess where I am? I've called them from the Great Wall of China. I've called them from a military base in remote Afghanistan and they still enjoy joking and saying, am I on a bus? Because that was the original mobile phone excitement. <laughs> this generation, the generation of the students at Radford, is more connected than ever before. It has greater opportunities than ever to benefit from connectedness, but it is at risk of being isolated socially by the very same technology. So we need to pay attention and be discerning. Keep track of what technology and mass media and the people who regulate us all are giving and what they're taking away. So what about the frog? And what does the frog have to do with anything? Well, if you put a frog in a pot of boiling water, logic would tell you it would be fairly sure to jump out. But the story goes that if you put a frog in a pot of cold water and turn the temperature up very, very slowly, that it will not notice it's getting hot and it will stay there until it's too late to do anything about it. Now I do acknowledge there are biologists who quibble with this theory. <laughs> Some say the frog will in fact always jump out. Others say no, if the temperature changes gradual enough, the frog will stay there and cook. So for your purposes in mind today, we're going to leave the frog in the pot because I need the frog for the metaphor. Okay? <laughs> and the metaphor is this. Unless we scrutinise the changes to our society and contemplate where they might lead, we risk ending up like, boiled like a frog, 
not detecting danger until it's upon us and then facing irreversible consequences. How does this relate to the media? Well, a free and independent media are accepted as one of the pillars supporting our democracy. The media are often called the fourth estate, and that's a reference back to the Middle Ages, when England and the nations of Europe had varying versions of three estates governing them socially and politically. They were the clergy, the religious rulers, the nobility, the royal or political rulers, and the commoners, who was everybody else. The press, now the media, became known as the fourth estate, an entity operating outside that established power structure, but seen as having an important influence on society. Now, you can argue that the activities of, of the fourth estate as we know them today are both helpful and unhelpful to a smooth-running democracy, both good and bad. It depends on your perspective. Let's look at the criticisms first. The fourth estate has a lot of power. Media proprietors can use their power to influence decision-making by government. <coughs> They can portray leaders as good or bad, sway voters, and help them determine who wins and who loses elections. They can relentlessly pursue a person or an issue, present only one side of an argument, distort facts, and focus more on entertainment than information. Almost 20 years ago, some of you will remember, Diana, the Princess of Wales, the mother of Princes William and Harry, died in a Paris car crash with her boyfriend, Dodi Al-Fayed, while being pursued by paparazzi photographers in cars and on motorbikes. Now that's the really ugly side of the news business or what passes as news. The pressure of relentless media attention can sometimes be too much to bear. It's important to remember that although the media behave like a single organism, they do not have one brain. Some of us do have a brain, but it's not one single brain or one heart or one conscience. I'm not saying these are absent. I'm just saying that while the media behave in a collective manner or seem to, they are plural, not singular a whole lot of competitive organisations behaving similarly, not a single creature which can be persuaded, tamed or turned very easily. Just ask the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Bronwyn Bishop, how she feels about the news media right now. <laughs> Will she ever escape all the merciless, hilarious helicopter references? Probably not. The media, traditional and social, are everywhere and Bronwyn is everywhere in them. You can blame the media for relentlessly pursuing her and keeping the story going. But if there weren't more examples of unorthodox expenses claims coming to light, it would quickly die down. And the trouble is, when a story comes along which reinforces a popular belief or prejudice, right or wrong, such as all politicians have their snouts in the trough, or which sees someone having done back to them what they've done to others, like a hardline speaker of the House of Representatives who chucks out opposition members for the smallest sin and then faces, faces harsh scrutiny for a $600 expenses claim or a $5,000 helicopter, and something that provides the irresistible opportunity to take the mickey, it sticks. And that is often not terribly comfortable for the person at the heart of it. So, for all the bad the media arguably do, is there much worth defending? Absolutely. Roman Bishop and many of her colleagues may be finding all this attention a little bit uncomfortable and it might be unfairly tarnishing the reputation of many good politicians and there are many good politicians, believe me. But it's also holding them accountable and that is a good thing. Sure, we in the media could collectively sometimes do our jobs a bit better but what if the media weren't there at all? Would we ever know what politicians claim on expenses? Or if they are behaving illegally? Would they bother to explain what they're doing in our name or why at all? Would we have any influence over any of it? I don't think so. It's fashionable to bash the news media, say we don't need the mainstream media anymore, that everyone with a smartphone can be a journalist. But, but few individuals have the resources to sink into investigating things properly. Without the guaranteed audience or readership of media organisations, individual citizen journalists can find it hard to access people with power. And the journalist's code of ethics, that does exist, risks being cast aside completely. True, there's a lot wrong with the way things are done by the traditional media. The 24-hour news cycle means that we're being bombarded constantly. But if you can't get the whole story now, well, it doesn't matter, you'll get a little bit of it now and the rest of it tomorrow and you know, eventually you'll get the whole picture. But what happens then is that context is being lost. But does that mean that we should give, give the whole game away? Should we just rely on individuals to hold up a camera phone and stream the world on Periscope and let that pass for news? 
can we do without context, scrutiny and someone asking questions? I think the answer is no. For all of our many faults, the news media do hold people accountable. Politicians will be much more careful about their expenses now, at least for a little while, and maybe they will actually even tighten up the rules and make them a bit clearer. And while the media too should be accountable for the role we play, we need defending against moves to reduce our capacity to hold others accountable. Journalists need protection from laws which would jail them for doing their jobs. Whistleblowers need protection from laws which would jail them for speaking up when something is wrong. Journalists ourselves need to guard against the tricks politicians use to make us less effective. There are a lot of those tricks. They can include playing favourites and drip-feeding leaked information to journalists or organisations that they like <coughs> as a reward for favourable coverage or just having high circulation or wide reach. Likewise, the tactics can include punishing those who publish or broadcast something that's seen as damaging or unfavourable, freezing them out, forgetting to invite them to private briefings, refusing to answer their questions or even take their questions. They can include both the mushroom treatment and the snowstorm. Favourites of mine, providing too little information so you're left in the dark, the mushroom, or so much irrelevant information that you're completely snowed and struggle to get out from under it and search for what they don't want you to know. And both practices are designed to hide what's really going on. So, we need more organisations and individuals involved in journalism, not fewer. More resources to fund investigations, not fewer. And we need to remember what it takes to bring us the news, that it's valuable, that it's worth something, that it doesn't come for free, that it connects us with our world, that the vehicles for it are not perfect and should be <coughs> scrutinised for sure, but that we should pay attention to what's going on around us and where we're headed. If we don't pay attention, we can fail to see the little tiny changes, the tightening of the laws, the restricting of movement, the demonising of some kinds of people, the favouring of others, which can change our society in ways we might not want if we stopped to think about it. It requires vigilance, being engaged with what's going on in the community, standing up for what we believe in, protecting those values we hold dear. So what can you do, what can we do as individuals to survive and thrive in the mass media world of constant communication? Think about the kind of community we want to live in and be alert to anything that's sending it in a different direction. Pay attention, as I said before, be discerning. <coughs> but don't just be discerning, be bothered. So that's three bits of advice. Pay attention, be discerning, be bothered. But because I'm not, uh, I don't stick by rules all the time, I'm gonna give you three more bits of advice. They always tell public speakers only three pieces of advice, too bad, you're getting six. So here are my other three. Whenever I'm asked to speak in public, uh, particularly to young people and particularly um, people starting out, I, there are three pieces of advice I like to give and I think they're particularly relevant in uh, this kind of multimedia world where you're trying to navigate mass media and social media all at one time. And it is relevant to you, believe me. The first is manage your time. Now I broke my own rule, didn't get here and, uh, as early as they would have liked me to, so ignore what I do but listen to what I say. Uh, <laughs> manage your time. If you don't, you'll be stressed. You'll be late, you'll be untidy, you'll pack badly for trips away and you'll find you have five suits, one pair of undies and no overcoat in a snowstorm. You'll lose things, forget things and be uncertain about things because you haven't been able to double or triple check them. It will affect your relationships and your confidence. Yes, it's true, I know this because, as you see, I don't always manage my time well. I'm not a natural manager of time. Start early, you'll be better at it. Whatever you do, whatever you can do to manage your time, try to do it. The second thing is this, control your fear. You will be scared of stuff through your life. That's normal and sometimes it's even good. If you have to interact with the news media or God forbid be a part of it like me, you will be scared regularly. Try getting up at the National Press Club and having to ask a question of the Secretary General of the United Nations with hundreds of people in front of you and thousands more watching on live TV. Try forgetting the question that you were going to ask the Secretary General of the United Nations or have had three questions written down and listen to all of them be asked one after the other and find you're rising to your feet having no questions. So there are things you can do to help mitigate that, control the fear. You will know fear if you're ever in that situation. You do need to learn to control it. 
But if you do learn to control it, something will come into your head in that situation. As you are rising to your feet and slowly speaking the name and the full title of the Secretary General of the United Nations, <laughs> buying yourself time, hopefully, mostly, if you're in control, your brain will click in and something will come. It might sound a little bit less than what you would have asked otherwise, but it will come. If you panic, if you do not control your fear, you will be humiliated. You will gibber and you will be live on television. That, that is not an edifying spectacle. Trust me, again. I did manage to get a question out on that occasion, but there have been other times. <laughs> you need to learn how to recognise the important, useful bits of fear. The little adrenaline rush that keeps you on your toes and the hairs on the back of the neck, sixth sense that lets you know when something isn't right. You can use the adrenaline rush to give you an edge to help you give your best performance. And you need to listen to the sixth sense if it's telling you to beware because it can save your life. Fear gives you those useful reactions and signals if you manage it well. But you need to not let fear paralyse you and stop you from speaking, make you burst into tears or refuse to step up. Because that sort of fear, the irrational kind or the perfectly, perfectly rational but actually quite debilitating kind, has to be kept under control. Otherwise, it will hold you back in that situation and in life. Throughout your life, you will not be the person you could have been, and that would be a shame. And the last bit of advice is the best in relation to the media. Guard your reputation. You're living in a multimedia world where everything you post can hang around forever and always, and where a brutal, relentless, not always compassionate news media can send the tiniest thing viral, or social media, in fact, particularly social media. I know the late playwright Oscar Wilde said the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about, but it's not actually always true. Ask Bronwyn Bishop. <laughs> Think you can delete a stupid, angry, rude tweet or post on, or something you posted on Snapchat or <coughs> Instagram and have it disappear? You might be lucky. Deleting it leaves no trace, except if someone who managed to realise the possible consequences faster than you did has screenshot it. You can't delete that. And that can be retweeted and retweeted and posted and reposted forever. And someone is sounding like that's a familiar story. It doesn't take much to maintain a good reputation, even a benign one, that's neither one way nor the other. Though, let's face it, we'd all rather have a good one. But once you have a bad one, it's really, really hard to change people's minds and get the good one back. In your study, in your work, among your friends, people will judge your character as much as your ability People can lose jobs, whole careers, because other people thought they were of bad character. Remember what I said again about Roman Bishop and the helicopter. She's now fighting to hang on to her job. That's all because people have got a set against her over her expenses claims. She let her reputation slip. It may be that those claims were within the rules as the rules are written, but people have made up their minds about that, and that's going to be very difficult for her to manage. On the other side of politics, Kevin Rudd was removed from the Prime Ministership because his own colleagues didn't like his behaviour, thought he couldn't make decisions and then panicked about him losing popularity. So I'm not saying that was a good thing, I think it's been a very bad thing, a disastrous thing for the Labour Party, but it did happen to him. You can't completely control how other people respond to you, especially not with the media the way they are, <coughs> when something can go viral in a flash. But you can influence it and that's worth remembering. The real trouble with all three of these final pieces of advice is that none of them are onces. They aren't things you can do once to fix the problem. They require constant effort, and that's hard. But where there is work, there is reward. So in summary, we need you to figure out who is genuinely trying to defend democracy and its values, the media and everyone else, and defend them. Pay attention, be discerning, and be bothered. And you need to defend yourself in this multimedia world as well. Manage your time, control your fear, guard your reputation. You young people, the future's up to you.